Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. Let's enter in together to the throne room of grace as we worship him.
Virus. We've been uh, keeping six feet of distance from one another and keeping ourselves as clean as possible. And luckily, I know of no one in our church who's caught the virus, which I thank God for. But uh, at this time, I'd just like to get into the word. Uh, Grace Bible Fellowship is a church in North Middletown, New Jersey. And uh, we're glad to be here proclaiming the truth of God's word. We're a Bible teaching church. And hopefully this will encourage you if you're a member or a guest or even if you've never seen anything like this before. We're going to read from the Bible. We're in 1 John chapter 2. And we're just going to read through the first 11 verses and what it says to us. But first, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity for us to be here. And for all of us who know you, we know that you knew us first that you know our rising up and our laying down, that you know everything about us from the beginning to the end. And Lord, you hold our lives in your hand. And we thank you that it's you and not chance, that it's you and not anything else that holds us. So Lord, we commit ourselves to you at this time. Pray that your word would go out. We find hearts that are plowed and ready to receive the seed of your word, that we all might become more like you. So help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book, as we've been going through, is 1 John. We're in chapter 2. I'm calling this a family resemblance. Because if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you're his, there's this resemblance that you have to him. And that's basically what the beginning of the chapter speaks of. So as we look, let's see if we can get this to work. I was reminded earlier today of a psalm, Psalm 127. It goes like this just by way of uh, a prelude and an encouragement. It's a song of ascents of Solomon. And he says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. 
It's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. It's an interesting passage. It basically says, no matter what it is that we do, it doesn't matter unless God's in it. God needs to be in it for us to be, for any of our efforts to amount to anything. So unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. If you know anything about the building of a house, if you know anything about how that goes, uh, you can build a house in lots of different ways in lots of different places. And it might seem precarious and it might seem as though you're on the edge of oblivion. But if the Lord is there and he's the one that built the house, then you don't have to worry about that because he's the one who put everything into place. So if the Lord builds the house, we have absolute confidence it's going to be okay. But if he doesn't and it's just our own efforts or our own abilities, we don't have much to have a lot of confidence in. And it also says that unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. The watchman was one who used to stay and do the, the couple of night shifts and stay up and watch to make sure there's no one invading the city. And he, his job was to make an alarm and make sure that everybody knew about it and so that they would be prepared and ready. And he says, unless, unless the Lord is the watchman over the city, then those of us who watch, it doesn't matter. Because if God's not in it, it doesn't matter. We can wake up early and we can, you know, rack our brains and go to sleep late and we can do all and expend ourselves. But it's not about our efforts. It's about God being in it. And so we can find ourselves at cross purposes with God. We can find ourselves at cross purposes with our prayers and asking God to do things that maybe the Lord doesn't want to do. We have to make sure that we're praying according to his will, according to his spirit and asking him to do those things that he wants us to do, so we need to be led in the Spirit to do that. So unless the Lord watches the city, the watchman, he watches in vain. And so what we tend to do is exert ourselves. We sit up late, we rise up early, and the, the scripture says that we eat the bread of sorrows. Basically, we drive ourselves crazy, whether it's workaholism or it's worry, whether it's uh, over-vigilance or complete apathy, we eat the bread of sorrows and we drive ourselves crazy with anxiety and depression and everything else because we bear it alone and we don't look to God for our strength. And then I love the last verse of this. The last stanza says, for so he gives his beloved sleep. If you know that God's in control of everything, if you believe in his sovereignty, and if you believe that you have a relationship with him and that he cares for you above all things, even his own son that he sent for you, well, then how could you not have a good night's sleep? How could you not rest easy? Just because you're not up doesn't mean bad things won't happen. Because God doesn't sleep or slumber. He's not going to miss any of them. And if you believe that you're in his hands, you can rest in his hands. So I was reminded of that as I was preparing for today's lesson. So I just figured I'd share Psalm 127 with you. Last week, we went through John chapter 1. We went specifically through the 10 verses. And what we can learn about when we as Christians, what does a Christian look like? Well, when we have fellowship with him, we walk in the light, which means we do those things that please him. We practice the truth. We have fellowship with him. It's a conversational, daily, moment-by-moment -moment relationship like you would with a friend. We have fellowship with him and our sins are continually washed from us. In other words, we're not bound by them. Certainly we fail and we fall short, but God won't allow us to be bound up in them and to have power over us. And when we do sin, it's no longer a, 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 the sort of a thing that we're a victim. We're a volunteer because we know better and we choose to. That's the difference between someone that's a Christian and not. And we're continually washed of them, which means they're always going away from us. We don't drag them around. We don't carry them around as some people do. We, we learned in verses 8 and 9 that we do not claim to have practical perfection. In other words, we don't live a perfect life. None of us is. And so be dishonest with ourselves and nobody else. But we possess the truth by confessing our sin and we receive absolution, forgiveness, and perpetual cleansing. That's what the scripture teaches in those verses in 8 and 9. So as I'm doing that, 
I have this relationship with God and I'm always being washed. I'm always released. I'm always forgiven, absolved of my sin. What a great life that is. And no matter what the world says, and they say, oh, you're crazy. God isn't real. And, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm happier than anybody else that I know because of that. Because I'm free of my sin. The things that I've done, I've asked God for, for forgiveness. And he's granted them because he's taken out his wrath on his only son, Jesus Christ. And so I'm free. So you might say God isn't real, but I'll tell you what. How do you explain that I'm not carrying a big duffel bag on my back full of the things that I've done and how I've hurt people, how I fail myself and fail God? Well, it's because he's perpetually cleansing me. So we learn that in verses 8 and 9 and verse 10. It says, if we confess to being born in sin and marred by sin and all of our thoughts and actions from our first breath until now, then we're truly walking with him because we never claim to be better than anyone else. We never claim to be sinless or that we've never made a mistake. We claim that we're still flawed. We're still working. We're all seeking to follow after Jesus. None of us is him. But we tend to look like him when we follow him because we do the things that he does. So we've gone over that last week. So this, this week we're going to go over chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. I'm titling this Family Resemblance because when you follow Jesus, when you do those things that please the Father, you look like him. You sound like him. You do those things that he would do. And there's a family resemblance. So let's read the passages. In verse 1 of chapter 2, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the whole world. Now, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him if we keep his commandments oh so i'm it does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoever keeps his word truly the love of god is perfected in him by this we know that we are in him he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and he hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness, and walks around in darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So the scripture makes two very strong points about what it looks like to know Jesus Christ, and how we can have this family resemblance to him. You may see lots of people that resemble one another. Uh, over here on the right, you see Paul McCartney and his son, actually. And they, they look very much alike. And here's Pierce Brosnan and his three handsome sons. And you have Tom Hanks and his son below him, and Arnold Schwarzenegger and his son beneath him, and uh, John Lennon and his son beneath him. And here's uh, Clint Eastwood and his son. You see how similar they are. It's funny how when you have families like that, they do look very similar. Um, and sometimes not with the greatest uh, attributes. Uh, luckily, these are just put on glasses and eyebrows. But a family resemblance is what happens, and when we spend time with Jesus, and when we're related to him, and he's doing a work in us, we resemble Jesus. And there are two ways in which that happens that the scripture bears out. First of all, he says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. So the very first reason that he gives for, not, for writing this is that we don't sin. It's a warning. It's, it's kind of, take, take stock of what you hear here in the scriptures because you may deceive yourself into thinking you're okay. If you attend a church and you warm a seat and you go home with a bulletin and uh, little else, you may think that you actually have a relationship with God. But this book is written so that we might understand what the true marks of a Christian are, what those features are 
where we look like Jesus. And so he says, that's why I'm showing you this, is so that you may not sin. It's not that you won't sin. So if you read this, you won't sin. It's not what it says. It says you may not sin. It's the opportunity so that we might take stock so that we don't. The next thing that he says is that we have an advocate with the Father. You might not know what an advocate is, but it's a lawyer, essentially. We have one who comes alongside and speaks on our behalf. The beautiful thing is that it happens to be Jesus who's our advocate, and it's God the Father who's the judge. So when you come before the judge, you don't have to worry you're coming before a judge that's going to find you guilty or somebody that's jaded or angry with you or has an attitude or a predisposition already to, to give you exactly what you deserve or call you a loser. But you have a judge in heaven where Jesus himself has taken upon himself the sins of the world. And because of that, we're free. And he has the absolute authority to give that to us. So he's our judge, and he's the one that you want to come before. We have an advocate with the Father. If anyone sins, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we have an advocate with the Father, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous. By the way, none of us are righteous. The scripture is very clear about that. None are righteous. None seek God. There are none who are good. Altogether, we become worthless, the scripture teaches us. So we understand that. At our very base core, we are selfish, self-centered people. And if left to ourselves, it would be the Lord of the flies all over and we just kill each other. Luckily, God is still here and he's still on the throne and he controls things. But we have an advocate with the Father. And Jesus, he himself is the propitiation. That's a word we use in, in the common vernacular here in New Jersey. A propitiation is a provision. It's, it's, a ex, it's an appropriate sacrifice instead of us. He's the propitiation or the provision for our sins, which should be you and I. But we don't get what we deserve. We get the life that Jesus gives, and he gets what we deserve, which is completely unfair. So don't complain that your life isn't fair. If it was fair, we'd all be in hell burning. So good thing. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours also, but for the whole world. It says that God so loved the world, by the way, it's the cosmos, that's the word, the original Greek, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whoever, whomsoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the scripture teaches. The blood of Jesus Christ is big enough for you and me and anyone that would come to him. There's not a limited sacrifice. It's a universal sacrifice, and it's for the whole world whom he loved, for all those who would come. So the scripture teaches it. That's what I believe. Verse 3, the first test of what it is to have a family resemblance to Jesus is obedience. Verse 3, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. It's very simple. If you love Jesus, you're going to do what he tells you to do. Right? Makes sense. He who says, oh, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, that's that which he has expressed to us and told us that we should do, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So it's an interesting concept. It almost sounds like perfection. That means I need to be exactly like Jesus in every way. Well, I can't do that. I don't know anybody that can. Can you walk on water? Then you're walking like Jesus walked. Can you heal anybody who comes to you? Can you restore those who are blind, maimed, deaf? Do you truly do that? Well, that's not what it means. What it means is that you do those things that he wants you to do. You walk in his commands. You know what he says. First of all, we've got to get a nose in the book. God's declared word, which is God's sermon to you, by the way. If you ever want to hear an excellent preacher, read the Bible. It's God's sermon to you. So just open it up. you, you got the best preacher. You don't, you don't need the internet. Trust me. He's much better. So the scripture says that if we know him, we're going to keep his commandments. If you don't keep his commandments, you say, yeah, I know God, but you live like a pig, and you live in the flesh, and you're enslaved by your desires, and you're not free, well, then you're not demonstrating you have any relationship with him, and the truth is not in you. The truth of, hey, I know him, that's not true. You're a liar. The scriptures flat out says that. John said that. He was an old man. He was in his 90s. You can take his word for it. 
It also says in John 15, 10, Jesus said, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. In other words, you're under the spout where the blessings come out. Just as I have kept my father's commandments, commands and remain in his love. So Jesus reiterates this statement that John's speaking so that you don't think it's only John who teaches this. It says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commands, commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. He says a little later in John chapter five, verse three. So this is a concept that goes throughout the scriptures. Jesus says in chapter 14 of the book of John, verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So it's a principle that runs throughout the scripture. If you love God, you're going to do what he tells you. If you're living in flat out rebellion and just doing whatever you want to do, don't pretend you don't because you don't. You're a liar. That's what the scripture says. Now, this might be disconcerting for you. It's a good thing that Jesus Christ came and you have an opportunity, if you're within the hearing of my voice, to be able to give your life to him and he'll make a change in your life. Good for you. Do it today. It says in James chapter 4, verse 11, do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. So the scripture tells us we have a choice. We can become judges and judgmental and point our finger and look down on people. Or we can look at the scripture and say, how can I more perfectly resemble my Savior? How can I do God's will in the way in which he wants me to do it? How can I have the heart and intent and the delivery and hold on to the truth of what he wants me to do? And, you know, if we can get those two things right, speaking the truth in love and doing what God wants us to do in the way he wants us to do it, we'll be good. Otherwise, we're lost. We can become very judgmental, and I have to tell you the church has a reputation for such a thing. To begin to look and to judge, you, you take the word and you put somebody else's life against it, you go, ho, 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 shame on you. Well, that's, you become a judge. Let the word of God judge. It's, it's certainly some people's job to judge some people. And it's not to point the finger and look down at them, because tell you what, all of us are made of the same stuff, and we're all sinners in God's eyes, and we all need grace. I hope you can say a hearty amen to that. So, a test of obedience is one of the things that marks a Christian. They do those things that the scripture teaches. Doesn't mean they're flawless, doesn't mean that they're perfect, but they do those things because Jesus is their savior and their Lord, he's the boss. He tells them what to do and they do it. That's what Christians do. So, then he begins in verse seven. Seven to eight is kind of a lead in to the next and I'll lead you there. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have heard from the beginning. So he says, one of the ways that we know that we're Christians is if we obey the commandment. He goes, I'm not telling you something new. I'm telling you something that's old. And then he said, the old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. The word that you heard reminds me of Greece, but uh, that's just my brain. The old commandment of the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Now, it sounds like double talk. I'm not telling you a new commandment. I'm giving you a new commandment. What he's saying is, I'm not giving you anything new that you haven't heard before. I'm giving you an old commandment, but I'm giving you a fresh view, is what he's saying. So I'm giving you a fresh look at this thing, and I want, I want to remind you, if you will. So that's what he's saying in, in very artistic ways. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. What commandment is it? it it's almost like he's... He's talking to the readers, and the readers know what he's saying, but you and I don't unless we continue to read on. And when we get there, you'll look back and say, aha. Here he's saying, there's a new commandment. It's not a new commandment. It's an old commandment, but it's new, and I want you to be fresh on this. This is the old commandment that you heard. Do you know what the old commandment is? Well, I don't know. The whole Old Testament is awful thick, and there's a bunch of things in there. But this is the new and improved, refreshed, hey, this is the new commandment. There was someone who came up to Jesus one time, and they asked him what the greatest commandment was. And he revealed to them the essence of the entire Old Testament. He combined two things. He said, the first is this, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
And on this hangs the entire Old Testament, all of the law and the prophets. That's what hangs, these two things. And if you know there are two tablets of the law, there's one that pertains our relationship with God and the other that pertains our relationship with one another. So if you think about all of the commandments that are there, so I have no other God before me, don't take the name of the Lord God in vain, uh, the Sabbath day, be holy. Well, he's got a bunch about him and about our relationship to him. And then there's a whole bunch of relationship with one another, right? Don't murder, don't steal, don't covet. Don't... So there's all of the commandments basically are summed up and love God with everything that you have, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So whatever you do for yourself, you should be willing to do for your neighbor. And who's your neighbor? Basically anybody. So he says, this is the old commandment. I'm not giving you a new commandment. I'm going to go back to the old. But it's the old kind of condensed in a way that maybe you haven't heard. And hopefully this is fresh for you. Love God with everything you have and love your, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you hold yourself up to that standard, I don't know about you, but I don't measure up. I love some people better than I love others. I'm more patient with some people than I am with others. And I tend to be kind of selective with that. Shame on me. So when I look up to that, I don't measure up. So what do I do? I confess, <laughs> because I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I confess that I'm a sinner and I ask for forgiveness and strength and help so that I can do those things that please the Father. So that's what we do. But this is what it is. And what we do is we do these things because the darkness is, is definitely on the way out and Christ is definitely on his way back. And I want to, I don't know about you, but I want to be in a right place when all that occurs. I don't want to be doing some silly shenanigan and find out, poof, I'm, I'm standing before the Lord. I don't need any of that. Uh, I don't know anybody. That's like one of the worst nightmares I think you could probably ever have. Verse 9, the second test of whether you're related to him or not. Verse 9, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Did you ever think when you saw somebody who was so full of hate and anger that they're blind? They're anger blind. They're so angry and so ticked off and so unforgiving that they're blind. They don't see. If you ever try to talk to somebody in that state, it's really hard to get through, unless the Lord does work in their heart, obviously, uh, or somebody slaps handcuffs on them. So, you know, you can't do that, but other people can. Here's the thing. If you hate, uh, hate means to disregard, prefer less, however you want to say it, it's not doing what God told us we should do, which is to love him with everything and love our neighbor as ourselves. Even the unreasonable, angry, horrible, persecuting, despicable, spitting at you, hate your guts people, those people. God says to love them. And it's much easier when I understand that they're blind. They don't know him. They don't have a relationship with him. I can tell you it's harder when people say, oh yeah, I know him, and they're still hateful. I have a problem with that. And the scripture does too. If you hate him, you're walking around in the darkness. And there's just, there's no light in you. So, in the darkness, it's something where we reach out from the darkness of where we are and we reach out for the Lord. And we're going to find that in his word. We're going to find direction and guidance and encouragement in his word. And especially at a time like this, that's the place to find it, in the word of God. So, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. He does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. That's in 1 John 4, 20 and 21. So we're going we're gonna to get there when we go to, to, to the, the end of 1 John someday. <laughs> so here it is. You must love your brother also. How can you love God who you've never seen if you can't love your brother who you do see? It seems like a silly question unless you understand God created human beings in his image. If God, the same God that says I should love him with my heart, soul, mind, and strength, says I should love my neighbor as myself, it's something I can do or he'd never ask me to do it. So, if I can't love somebody I do see who's been made in the image of God, who's just as flawed and, and messed up as me, if I can't have compassion 
to love them and be obedient to do what God says, how am I going to love God who I've never laid eyes on physically? How am I going to love him? These folks are made in his image. And they're, they're going to have an eternal soul. If I can't love them who I do see and are right in front of me, it's like saying, you know, I have a bicycle. I, I leave it out in the rain and I don't care where it is. And I really hope somebody steals it because I'm really hoping for a new one. Well, if you're going to get a new bike, which you've never seen, you're going to take care of it just like the old bike that you do have. So it's, it's a false hope is what it is. If you're going to love God and say that you love God, it needs to be demonstrated in the way that you treat somebody. And it means that you treat them with love. You treat them in the way that you would want to be treated, which is a completely different paradigm from what this world tells us to do. So if we love God, you can't hate your brother because you're walking around in darkness. If you hate your brother in darkness and you walk around in darkness, you don't know where you're going because the darkness is blinding your eyes. If you walk, if you love your brother, you're abiding in the light. There's no way that you can love unworthy people without God's spirit, without walking in the light. There's just no way you can do it. You don't have the capacity to do that unless you've been filled with the love of God. You don't have it to give away. So the test of love is the second part of it. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness, even until now, regardless of what you might think. So, I used to know how this worked. And it's always something. That's why they call the devil the prince of the power of the air. So, we're always fighting against the darkness. We're always striving against it. But there's a point at which we ask Christ to come into our lives, illuminate us, and make us new. And then what happens is we go into the light. And then it's, it's going to be a battle, but we're on the winning side from then on, which is beautiful. So just to remind you of what the scripture teaches true love is, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love is not rude or selfish. It cannot be easily angered. Love always protects, it always trusts, it always hope, hopes, it always perseveres. And above all, love never fails. That's what love is. Love is an unconditional desire and commitment to another's best good. That's the best definition I could find. It's the, it's the highest hopes and the commitment to another's greater good. And that's what it's above yourself, it's above your own interests, it's above all of that. It's thinking mostly of the other person. And sometimes somebody needs to be warned. Sometimes someone needs to be encouraged. Sometimes somebody needs help. Sometimes they need to be sternly warned. Jesus did this with everyone. He always found what other people needed and he met them where they were and he gave them what their greatest need was. He was good enough to be able to see into the hearts of people and know what they needed. And he spoke exactly the right thing. And if we follow him, and if we're in a relationship with him, we can do the same thing. We can ask God to give us wisdom and help us with our words and with our attitudes and with what we do. And he can guide us into doing that. And we can be his hands and his feet. So love is being patient, which means there's always a struggle in me to not be patient. Love is when you don't do those things that you would otherwise do if you were impatient. Love is kind. It means that I think more of the other person than myself. They insult me and say something about me. I don't worry about that. I worry about why they would say something like that and how I might help with the root of whatever it is they're struggling with is. So you don't take it personally. And Jesus did this. So that's why we do that. We love because we're in the light. We love because he first loved us, John 4.19 says. He first loved us and we were much less worthy than anybody that you would show love to. Because he's perfect, and we're not. And he shows us love in spite of who we are. A relationship of love with God and others is the purpose of all history. It really is. It's the purpose of everything. If your life was just about accumulating things, what happens when they put up the tombstone and you breathe your last? Nothing. It goes to a bunch of people who didn't work for it and will squander it. What if your life was about building a corporation or a city or a cure for something and you're dead and gone and it's a tombstone that doesn't mean anything. Relationships are what means everything. Your relationship with God because it lasts for eternity and your relationships with brothers and sisters, which 
also lasts for an eternity. And if you're if you're in a good place with the Lord, you might be able to share that with people who don't know him, and they can become part of your family as well. And that is forever. So it's important. The relationship of love with God and others is the purpose of all human history. Think about that. It's a big statement. So, things we learned last time. If we have fellowship with him, we walk in the light. We practice the truth. We have fellowship with him, and our sins are continually watched from us. In verses 8 and 9 of chapter 1, we do not claim practical perfection. So anybody who claims perfection, watch out for them. And so be dishonest with ourselves. But we possess the truth by confessing our sin, and we receive absolution, confession, uh, I'm sorry, forgiveness, and perpetual cleansing. So we confess before God, and we confess to one another. It says, confess your sins one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's a special healing power that God promises in all of that. And in 1 John 1, 10, if we confess to being born in sin, we, what we do when we're walking with him is we confess to being born in sin and marred by sin in all of our thoughts, actions from our first breath until now. We confess that we're not perfect. We haven't arrived. We, have, we were born in sin. We continue to sin, and we still struggle with sin until the day that we leave this body. To say that you don't is really a lie. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 say we have an advocate and a propitiation for our failures. It's Jesus Christ. He is the provision for our failures. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, in verses 3 to 5, we do those things that he tells us to do. That's what we do. That's one of the demonstrations that we belong to him, is that we do those things that he asks us to do. And in 7 to 11, it says, we live by the law of love as Jesus has shown us. We show love. That's what we do. Not towards those that are good to us, those that we have something to gain from, but we show love to one another. And we don't harbor bitterness. We don't hate people. We don't uh, wish ill will on people. That's something that you let go of. And if you can't let go of it, you're walking around in the darkness. You, you're just lost. And you need Jesus Christ. So... That's essentially what we learned, I think, today to verse 11. I just wanted to share with you just one more song for any of you who need encouragement. There's a there's a wonderful picture of a lighthouse that stands against the sea, and uh, the sea is beating it uh, pretty hard. In Psalm 62, verses 5 to 8, reads this way in the ESV. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Because we don't put our faith in human beings. We don't put our faith in science. We don't put our faith in in the unknown because if so that's incredibly unsettling so it says here oh people pour out your heart before him because god is a refuge for us and there is no better pair of hands that you could be in than in the hands of the lord jesus christ i pray that this message blesses you in the name of the lord jesus